Hey y'all, appreciate you watching the Certified Horror Show, which is really just sort of a visual diary of my life, little pieces of it, and my thoughts. And it's really kind of a place for me to dump my emotions, is what it's turned into. And it turns out I have a lot more emotions than I ever really addressed in my entire life. Um, and I probably would have had a really different life if I was ever taught to focus on what am I feeling. I don't know what I was... I wasn't directly taught a whole lot of things, but, you know, there was plenty of things modeled to me. There's a truck coming in over this bridge right here. Right there. Granted, we're in a drought, so the water is really low right now. But right there is where my second wife baptized me and then I baptized the kids and just today we went to the same spot it's been a couple of years you know probably been like four years or so more than that actually but we went to the same spot and I asked him you want to get baptized again and my daughter was a little reluctant and she'd said no and I said why and she said she said, I don't, I don't think I'm worth it. And, uh, <clears throat> which kind of hurt, hurt me a little bit. Not, hurt me because I knew that it was a confirmation of what I already knew. It was, she confirmed what I already knew. Our child, her childhood, even though it was the best that me and her mom could provide, it wasn't stable. It wasn't safe. It wasn't secure. And, the good news is, it's not too late. She hasn't run off. She hasn't overdosed. She hasn't, uh, you know, married some abusive man and got a bunch of kids. She's still my baby. She's still willing to come to me with her issues. She's still willing to talk to me. She's still willing to come and, you know, let me hug her and tell her how much I love her and how much she changed my life. Uh, how much she gave me an identity. I was a person lacking an identity. And I didn't know... <clears throat> the Lord knew, but I didn't know that dad was the identity that I needed to have. There's a spider web. Yeah, there's a spider web drifting past the screen. So this is a dear place to me. It's a very special place to me. And there's a lot of crazy stuff. There's a lot of riffraff happens here, but it's wild and free. And that's what I like. I don't want some hall monitor authority figure in my life that doesn't actually have real power. Um... There's a, there's, a, there's a power that I respect. I quake and tremble under the fear of the, the power of the Lord and of the consequences of going against Him. I'm very much in awe of His authority. But there's a whole lot of authority that I'm a little rebellious towards. I don't even know what the point is. I guess that I, I like that the place is wild. I like that anything goes out here. You could you could meet your best friend out here for the rest of your life. You could end up stabbed or shot out here. You never know. It's just a bunch of rednecks all getting along, coexisting as they say. I know that if my truck broke, there'd be five guys would walk up and say, hey man, what do you need? Can I help you? There's no question about it. And I just, I just like that people are free to work out their own stuff out here. <clears throat> It's the same on my road. We're free to be friends or enemies. We're free to have war or peace. And I have peace. I have peace with people that are just as wild and crazy as I am. More. Way more. More than I am. But I have peace with them. And this place is peaceful to me. I'm just so thrilled that God uprooted me from the place where I lived that didn't have anything like this at all. This is such a small fraction I mean, you could go for miles in any direction and be in wilderness out here. Just what you can see, where, I'm, where I was raised, this would be some fancy state park with all kinds of signs and rules and, you know, green trash barrels and facilities and a gravel parking lot would be right there and it wouldn't be wild and free. I like that it's wild. I like that I'm going to sleep here all night and no matter what happens, there ain't some kind of authority figure running out here. You're on your own, and I like that. I like being on, 
on my own. I'm not sure why. I'll have to ponder that. Janelle's gonna come tomorrow, which I'm excited about and nervous about. I'm nervous about the responsibility of caring about someone else's heart. <clears throat> um, but I think that's a good nervousness. Because in the past, I never had, I never ever had any kind of fearful avoidant features because I didn't really care if, about anybody but myself. I didn't care if someone else's heart got hurt. In my mind, they're grown up. They need to look out for themselves. It's not my job. I'll be who I want to be. And if they like it, they can have it. And if they don't, see you later. I didn't really care. I wasn't very cautious with other people's feelings. I certainly was not cautious with my ex-wife's feelings. And she was not cautious with mine. And um, trauma bond is an incredible thing to go through. CPTSD, that is complex trauma. <clears throat> I don't think that that was really studied or researched or understood or a thing. You know, I'm 44, so in, in the 80s and the 90s, I don't think that that was a thing, a concept. But it's starting to get some traction and it explains so many people's problems. Almost all of these diagnoses of, you know, psychological disorders, they all come from childhood. Almost all of them. And I, I'm not known for optimism. I'm really not known for optimism, but I want to be. I want to be. I don't want to be pessimistic. I don't want to be a worry wart. I don't want to be negative. And I just discovered... Uh, Tim Fletcher is a psych psychologist, child psychologist, I guess, who he has some wonderful data on CPTSD. And it's like who I am came from that. It's like reading a roster of my characteristics. <clears throat> I didn't live as a kid thinking my life's crazy. It, I perceived it as completely normal. Completely normal. It wasn't until I was a grown man being around other people and finding out their life was not anything like mine. And that's where it was like, oh, yeah, I guess I didn't have a really normal compared to these guys. Like, I don't know what, I don't know where they found their parents at, but mine weren't nothing like that. Poverty makes a lot of dire situations. And I'm not saying that poverty's wrong. You can't appreciate wealth without poverty. It's just like day without night, what's the value in it? And I have no complaints. Um... I don't have any hard feelings about my parents, the things that they did. I, I feel bad for what they endured because they had harder life than I did. They gave me, my parents gave me a better life than they got. And I'm so thankful for the both of them. Love you. I love you too. I'm so thankful for the both of them. And I hope someday that my kids can say the same thing. I hope that the quality of parenting skills in my lineage, in, in my bloodline my posterity I hope it gets better and better and I think it will and I think knowledge information when you put information and discipline together I think you have the recipes for a serious change and the greatest discipline exercise I ever did in my life was that 12 day fast I've said it many times before I, the Holy Spirit told me 40 day fast <clears throat> in my head I heard in my inner monologue just out of the blue it wasn't on my mind in any kind of way skeeters are starting to come out 40 day fast and I was like there's no way I can do that and he said do you trust me like if you don't think you can do it that means you don't trust me so if you say you trust me if you say you're mine then show me put your money where your mouth is and I was like okay if you're going to do the work I'll go along with it and I'd only ever gone like 48 or 50 hours before by day four it started getting easy like day five I had no almost no interest six seven eight it, it was so easy I, I know that sounds nuts but it was really actually easy and maybe that's because God answered my prayer and he did the work for me I wasn't muscling through it I was just seeing a water bottle and saying Jesus that's you in there that's you in there I choose you it wasn't I I couldn't have done it if I said in my in my mind I choose not to eat that I choose not to eat that I choose not to eat that no it wasn't choosing a negative. It wasn't choosing a don't. It wasn't choosing an I won't. It was choosing an I will. I want you. I'm looking at a water bottle 
in my hand and saying, Lord, I want you. Lord, I want you. Lord, I want you. Yeah, it tasted like gutter water. It tasted awful after five, six days. And by, oh man, it got really bad by the time I threw in the towel. Um, and I felt like I sinned. Just eating a cookie, I felt like I sinned. And the feeling was, I didn't choose you, Lord. It wasn't that the cookie was bad. It was that I stopped choosing Jesus for one decision. One decision. Murdering a man is one decision. Um, you know, having sex with a woman that's not your wife is one decision. That's how fast sin can jump into your life. You can make the right decision 30,000 times and make the wrong one once. And poof, there's sin. And somebody's got to pay for it. But the good news is, the good news of the gospel is that Jesus Christ is came in the flesh. <clears throat> we serve a triune God. I serve a triune God. That means three in one. Three distinct but, but singular. So they're one and they're independent. Like they're together and they're independent. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, all three of them are God. And I know that's hard to wrap your mind around. <clears throat> Some people use the pretzel analogy. That a pretzel is one linked together little dough ball, but it's got three different pockets. Um, the good news is that Jesus came in the flesh. He lived the perfect life. He's the only one who fulfilled all 600 and something of the Jewish laws and showed up for his appointment for my cross for your cross he showed up 15 minutes early and it wasn't no root canal it was worse than that he didn't want me or you to go on that cross he wanted to take our place he chose to out of love <clears throat> and he says in 1 John pretty sure it's 1 John or maybe it's John 14 28 I could be wrong but he's, he says to the disciples, if you really loved me, like you say you do, because they were worried. They're, they were saying, Master, Master, don't go away. He's saying, I'm going to be going away. He's telling them. He's, he's given the prophecy of his, of his death, which is right around the corner. And they're saying, no, we won't let that happen. And he's like, he says to Peter, get behind me, Satan. You don't know what you're talking about. Like, you guys are thinking in your own terms. You don't understand what, what I understand, what me and the Father understand. So stay out of it. This has to happen. You don't understand. You guys don't understand. This has to happen. And in one, or maybe it's John 14, 28, wherever it is where he says, this is what love is. He says, if you love me, you would want me to go away. I'm going to be going away. They're, no, no, no. That would suck for us. He says, it would be good for me. And if you love me, you would want what's good for me, even if it does suck for you. And Jesus showed what that looks like. Going on a cross for me sucked for him, but he did it out of love. That's love. That's the ultimate. I could cry right now just thinking about it. <clears throat> could I could I climb up on a cross so my kid doesn't have to? I don't know. I hope so. But I don't know. I don't know if I have that discipline. I could probably shoot myself to not have to see it, but I don't know if I could climb on a cross for my kid. But Jesus climbed on one for me. And for you. And for my children. And for my ex. And for her boyfriend. For all of us. For all, the, for all the people that you hate, he died for, so that they could be forgiven. <clears throat> he descended, he stayed in the grave for three days to fulfill the prophecy. And he rose, ascended to heaven, he is risen. He laid his body down and he picked it back up again because he had the will to do that. And that's it. All who call on him and believe in him, all who believe that message that I just gave to you, will be saved. And if you hate that message, I still love you. If you want to criticize and condemn me in the comments, you're welcome to. I'll pray for you. At least I'll try to. I understand if you don't believe I was an atheist, the day I was going to shoot myself, and minutes before... It was a fireball in the sky right over my head, and that's the day that I knew there was absolutely a creator. He transferred a pile of information into my soul that I will never, ever let slip. I will believe... I will throw away any piece of 
uh, information that we all consider to be a fact. I'll believe the earth is flat before I believe that there's no God because I experienced it and I can never unexperience it. And I'm going to spend the rest of my life sharing that message. He answers my prayers. And he gives me an identity. <clears throat> I didn't know who I was from five years old. I had an identity crisis at five when I said, Mommy, why did you leave? And she said, I left because of you. I couldn't understand that she was broken and my dad was broken. So the only thing I could do was say, I must be broken. And it gave me a huge identity crisis. And I was never able to fill in anything stable. I built all my castles on sand. It always washed away and my towers toppled and fell over. Oh, these mosquitoes are eating me. Bad. The good news is that Jesus is who he said he is. And I am who he says I am. I am who he says I am. That's my identity. I am, who, I am a son of the Most High God. I serve a king. And that's all I really want to do. People, I appreciate you watching. If you're stuck in a cubicle dreaming about a place like this, I hope you turn your back on that money and walk away from it. The Bible says that a, <clears throat> a rich man will be stuck on this earth because of his money. It says a camel will go through the eye of a needle easier than a rich man will get to heaven because he can't let that baggage go. I lost my house a year. I claimed $106,000 of income taxes, and I was miserable. My marriage was broken. My life was miserable. I was scared to death. Money didn't solve any of it. I put my last dollar in the tank in that truck today. I'm having a fantastic day. I'm, I made 60 bucks yesterday selling something. I bought $39 full of junk food. $39 worth of junk food. Did I say full of? The full of was going into the tank. So the tank's got 20 bucks in it. The tank, the fuel tank on that truck's got $20 in it. And that cooler's got 39 you know what? That's probably the best 60 bucks I ever spent because my kids are here and they're never going to forget. What else could I do with $60 that would be unforgettable? Like going to the river where he was baptized and doing it again. And camping out, cooking s'mores, and overdosing on Coca-Cola and Sprite all night, which I never, ever let them do. There's something really great about their mom. She knows how to let them have a junk food day. And I was always stingy about it. And she was right and I was wrong. Appreciate your time. Thanks for watching. God bless you and praise the Lord.